So hey guys, welcome to the third episode of Just a Chat With. We're here today with Thomas Ho. Uh, Thomas is an investor, an entrepreneur and artist. He co-founded Love Film, is the founder of the Met Film School in London, Grove Street and the founder of Arts Alliance Ventures, which backs over 50 startups, including LastMinute.com, Shazam, Ocado, Creative Live, Made.com and Tales.com, just to name a few. Thomas. Thanks for having us today. Um, now that was a long list and that's probably only half of the list or a quarter of the list. Um, so I suppose to start us off, it'd be quite interesting to know um, where it all began, how you got into business and a little bit about your earlier years. Sure. The, um, I started my career working in radio drama okay. and uh, uh, it was uh, uh, educated as a as a theatre director mm -hmm. um, and worked on, s on stage, but my first real job was in the Norwegian Broadcast Corporation um, directing radio drama. And it was uh, an extraordinary privilege to work with the best actors in the country uh, in a format which was so naked. Mm -hmm. Was this in the UK? Or no, it was in Norway. Norway? Yeah. Uh, and so radio radio drama, um, there is nothing to hide behind. Yeah. So the it's everything is what is comes into the microphone, what's mm -hmm. s spoken, and it's all about the delivery of of the voice. And so as a training ground, it turned out to be amazing. Um, and I I learned a lot from thinking about the audience, which is really kind of the core of of what I now do, is always think about the audience or yeah. the customer. Uh, in, in every business I'm involved with. Yeah. Uh, and so I always kind of revert back to that principle. Um, and um, so the combination, so, I, so alongside doing radio drama, I was also involved in um, running, uh, I managed bands and I ran some uh, music festivals yeah. and uh, lots of concerts and so on, and sort of as a promoter and a, Hustler. Yeah. Um, what kind of bands? What kind of? Oh, music really music? bad bands. Loud, angry bands. And but it was it was good fun. Yeah. But it, uh, and it was they the, the two worlds kind of merged when I got into slightly bigger, bigger gigs, yeah. um, and it became live television. It became chaotic and large and lots of moving parts, and. I had a reasonable knack for managing the balance between the artistic ambition, mm -hmm. but also the practical stuff. Yeah. It's like live television starts at four o'clock. Yeah. There's no excuse. Uh, and that, that, that discipline uh, means that you can, yes, you can be creative, but you have to be creative within certain constraints. Yeah. And that's uh, very similar to what I do with startups. Yeah. Um, push the boundary, push the boundary, but always deliver. Um, and that, th and finding the balance between those two is, is in essence everything I've been doing uh, yeah. in just different permutations. So how did you, how did you find your way from you know um, radio to st the startup world? Then how did that, how did that come about? So it came about. Um, <coughs> I had I had a an opportunity which was. A bit of luck, um, uh, where um, I was working for a director, a very experienced director in, in Norway called Bentheim Borchel, uh, and he he had lots of projects. Yeah. Um, and we were organizing the uh, Winter Olympics in Norway at the time, okay. uh, and the team that had been hired to make the opening and closing ceremonies mm -hmm. spectacularly failed. So about two years before the games, the organizers pulled the plug on that team and said, mm -mm, we're not going to run with that. Okay. We need to do something different. Yeah. So they contacted my boss and said, would you, would you come in and do this? Yeah. And he said, well, I have, I have a commitment to make a film here or make a television series there, and I'm directing these three plays. This, I don't have the capacity, but I have a very good assistant. Mm -hmm. And so if you make him the principal on-site on director, yeah. and I will oversee it, uh, I can take it on. Okay. They didn't have much choice. 
<laughs> so, um, and they said, well, you know, he's 25. Yeah. He has, you know, okay, he's done a few, few things that are good on his own, but, you know, he's still young. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, but he has done chaos with all this rock and roll stuff. Uh, and he, he's got my trust to do this, and we can do it together. And uh, so that's, so I ended up then doing the biggest show that I would ever do, uh, which, which was the opening and closing ceremonies. Um, and 1994, was that yeah. correct, yeah? Okay. And it was, uh, uh, but it was not, uh, it, you know, it was a sort of roundabout way. <coughs> When it was then completed, mm -hmm. um, I, I looked upon myself as a has-been. I said, okay, I'm not going to, that's it. I'm, if I now go back to the National Theatre and start directing for the Blue Hairs again, I'm just going to die. Yeah. Uh, I have to do something different. Yeah. Um, and so I uh, ventured over to the, the States yeah. um, and uh, I started uh, uh, started uh, looking into what to do next, and I, I met some very smart people at the MIT Media Lab. Okay. And they were much, much smarter than me. Uh, but they had never made anything for real humans. When they looked at a computer, they kind of looked through the screen and into the CPU and the motherboard and, and couldn't understand why everyone else didn't <laughs> do the same. <laughs> And they made the classic mistake that they, they had no clue that normal people looked at that machine, especially in 1995 when this was happening, yeah. as a, something that was pretty scary and the internet was not very user-friendly at all. Yeah, yeah. And they, they, they all came with it. It's like, you know, but you just put in some code here and it will be fine. It's like, yeah, but I can assure you, most people won't do that. Yeah. <coughs> so to some extent, I became their interpreter. Mm -hmm. And I had this calling card that from having the Olympics in the back pocket yeah. um, and being, I had been introduced by the guys from, from CBS who were the bro broadcaster uh, and they kind of, so, so I, had a, I had a sort of, a, I suppose, a, a kind of a privileged position yeah. being, uh, I had no responsibilities, but they kind of invited me to do whatever I wanted. Yeah. And that was fun. Um, and so I got involved in a whole bunch of, uh, of small embryos of startups, um, more as a kind of um, advisor and kind of that sort of thing. And yeah. they said, well, we can't pay you, so we can you take some shares? Yeah, and yeah. okay, so I did that. And at the same time, I had also been admitted to the Harvard Business School. Okay. So my ambition was to go to Harvard Business School to learn a bit more about how to sort of run numbers and so on, yeah. and then go back to Norway and run one of the cultural institutions. At the time, we still had a national broadcast corporation that was kind of the, the broadcast corporation. Okay. We had a national film uh, company. Yeah. And we had all the cinemas were all state-owned. I mean, it was a basically a socialist state with government-controlled media. So my ambition was to go back and run one of those. Yeah. Um, I never did that. Um, because while I was at Harvard, uh, I then got more involved with some of these startups. And then I also, and then some people said, well, perhaps we should, um, you know, you're pretty good at working with these startups. Maybe you should put some money to work. Yeah. And so that's, then I got some investors and then, then they sort of started rolling. Okay. And then before I knew it, I was, in venture capital without really thinking that I was. Yeah, yeah, sure. um, and it wasn't designed that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is also why Arts Alliance has always been quite loose, it's why it's somewhat different in that we have always been extremely product centric yeah. and looked at, the, at, at the, the way products work at the core of every company. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and we still do. And so, where did the whole, you know, you, you co-founded Love Film, how did that come in, you know, where, where did that story start and, you know, how did you, how did you kind of sure. find your way there? So we, um, in the first wave of companies we were involved in, lots of them were music related. Yeah. <coughs> and we had... Is that because that was your passion? You yeah, and I, had an, I, and I had lots of contacts. Yeah. And I knew, I, I understood the music business. Um, I had, I had been managing bands and I had a record label and yeah. we had you know, been involved in music venues and you know, there was a lot of stuff. Um, but, and, and we, I didn't, I didn't spot Napster 
uh, but I just spotted that shipping around the master was a really bad idea. The, C, the CD as the master, mm -hmm. the, the, the music industry would suffer from yeah. shipping that around. Yeah. But I could see how easy it was to digitize it and to then share it, and, and I could see that this, this is gonna end badly. Mm -hmm. So I sold all of my music assets yeah. uh, in the late 90s, okay. because I sort of saw where it was heading, and um, we were lucky to have some good timing on that. Mm -hmm. um, so we had the first wave of internet music companies okay. in our portfolio, uh, and it was Spinner that was sold to AOL, and it was um, Launch that was sold to Yahoo, yeah. and, uh, and we um, we said, okay, we think that film is going to be a bit different, um, partly because um, the 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 core of the music business was that you wanted to listen to something again and again, whereas film. You you may see a film twice, but yeah. you not you don't see the same film every day. Over, yeah. But some people would listen to Stairway to Heaven yeah. way too much, uh, <laughs> uh, and and other other music that you know it's yeah. you've got a soundtrack to your life, yeah. and you you switch from things and you may discover new things. But there's also some core stuff that is really important. Yeah, there's core stuff that stays yeah. with you your whole and life, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> and I think the. Um, so we said, well, actually, we think that the, the, the and, uh, so the first thing we did then was we went out and bought a cinema chain. Yeah. Uh, and that was, uh, it was a small chain at the time, uh, Picture House Cinemas. Um, a terrific team that ran it, um, a, two partners who, um, Lynn Golby and, and um, Tony Jones, who were passionate and really capable at running cinemas. Yeah. Um, and we then started to scale it um, together. So we were the controlling shareholder, but they were still significant shareholders, and we started to build out more cinemas, and we, start, we, took, over, uh, we took over some other cinemas, including the, the Cameo in, in Edinburgh. Mm, yeah. and, uh, um, and we also did something which now seems like a, you know like anyone would do, but at the time it was very novel in that we built our own box office system and CRM tools and membership systems and so on to, to understand the taste of our customers. Yeah. Um, and it was it it, it was uh, revolutionary. I remember the first time we um, introduced this idea to the staff. Um, as I, as I can imagine, an art house staff comes in in all all kind of creeds and colors and permutations and yeah, political yeah. persuasions and so on. Yeah. And fantastic group of people and considerable PhDs mm -hmm. with no ability to do anything but to take tickets. <laughs> um, it was an extraordinary group of people. And I remember one of them who was an assistant manager in one of the sites uh, when we talked about kind of building up CRM profiles and getting to know the customer properly. And she just stood up and said, we are not going to have any fucking CIA here <laughs> and stormed out. It's like, ooh, shit. <laughs> that, was, that was good. That was a good Biggest start. start yeah. <laughs> so um, maybe we should break for lunch. <laughs> um, and I realized that I had to win her over. Yeah. Because if I didn't win her over, it, the whole be it yeah. would be dead. So I, uh, I step by step tried to understand, uh, explain to her that this was trying to be able to be more adventurous with what we programmed, yeah. and to take more risk, and to, uh, in essence, include our customers in in how we ran the cinemas. Yeah. We were not there to exploit them. Yes, the si a very positive sign benefits is that we, have had, we would get better attendance and we would delight them more. Mm -hmm. But it was not an intent to then sell on that information to third parties and, and uh, suck their blood mm -hmm. in some way or another. Um, and step by step, she bought into it. And the next time we had a sort of a meeting with all the m managers and assistant managers, she presented. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then she had uh, drank the she drank the Kool Aid properly, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, she started she ran the whole program. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she turned 180 degrees, yeah. but it took took a little while to get there, mm -hmm. but it was certainly an interesting uh, interesting transformation. 
Um, and so when we then had this footprint mm -hmm. of cinemas across the country, we had access to about two million um, unique uh, cinema goers okay. per year yeah. that came through the doors in one way or another. And that was an extremely interesting starting point to do other things. Yeah. So for instance, I was very frustrated that we didn't have much daytime traffic. Yeah. So we started the film school okay. using the cinema and Clapham in the daytime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and it turned out eventually that the cinemas weren't really perfect for film education. Yeah. But it was a start and we also created a bit of a sense that you can do other things in cinemas. Um, and it was then, uh, you know, we, we also had lots of innovation on what, what could be done. Uh, and uh, great ideas came from left, right and center inside the company when they realized that, that we're invited to have ideas. Yeah. So, uh, so, so Picture House, they initiated the big screen, which was mothers with babies okay. that were below a certain age, I think it was a year and a half or something, where they could watch anything on the screen yeah. that had no impact on them. As soon as they get a bit older, yeah. they, they should be sheltered from violence and so on. Okay. But below a certain point, they, ha they couldn't realize what was going on. Yeah. So you could really show them anything yeah. and it wouldn't impact them. Okay. That meant that also the mothers could come and see the films that they otherwise wouldn't see because they were afraid that their babies would be screaming. Yeah. And so we said, scream as much as you want. <laughs> um, and and, and the, it was really, uh, and then we said, well, hang on a minute, there's some other people who don't feel welcome. Yeah. So we started sc uh, having screenings for autistic kids yeah. uh, that otherwise, and, and I can assure you that for parents that meant a lot. Yeah. Suddenly they could do things with their kids that yeah. they otherwise felt that they really were a bit afraid of yeah. um, and we did we started doing uh, lots of stuff around seniors and mm -hmm. basically start just thinking about an yeah, audience get, yeah. much more creatively yeah. um, and I'm I, that was um, it was uh, I think one of the most thing the things that I'm most proud of is this idea that you know if you give staff mm -hmm. an opportunity to innovate it's incredible what can what can come out of it yeah um, I then remember when we introduced the idea of love film. Yeah. Um, I remember Tony uh, Jones was very opposed to it. He said, "Well, they're going to stop coming because you're going to now they can all everyone can just watch movies at home." Yeah. And I said, "Hang on a minute. That was the same argument that was used for the when people were going to try to kill the the Betamax <laughs> and the VHS mm -hmm. because this this is the end mm -hmm. of cinema. It's we're done." And of course it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, on the contrary, we built up a much tighter relationship and we could prove that the, 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 the Love Film subscribers, they went more to the cinema mm -hmm. because they were, they were, they had, they, their passions were, were giving nutrition. Yeah. Uh, and we made lots of events around, around, uh, around this and we had special screenings for Love Film subscribers. Mm -hmm. And we, we also made sure that we could get really obscure titles mm -hmm. uh, so that, and this is one of the sad things that happened when Amazon bought the business, um, was that some of that was lost a bit. Yeah. Now, it's, it's actually re-emerged. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and the, and that's, the great thing is that most of the people who, who were at Love Film when Amazon bought the business mm -hmm. are still there. Yeah. So they it's, it's run Amazon Prime video. So they run Amazon, Amazon Prime, yeah. and the and the and they and it's a, it's still a big base, yeah. uh, and it's run out of London mm -hmm. worldwide, mm -hmm. um, and that's um, so. so and I, I spoke to the guy who runs Amazon in the UK recently, and, and, and I asked him, you know, many years later now, was how was that was that a good acquisition? Mm -hmm. And he said, fantastic. Yeah. You know, it really worked well. And when was that? When did the acquisition for that? Um, Four years ago. Four years ago. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I loved Love Film, by the way. I remember getting the, the DVDs arriving. Sure. It yeah, it's felt like a little bit of cinema dropping through your letterbox. Mm. It was, uh, <laughs> well, it worked. Yeah. I was actually sad when it disappeared. You know, I yeah. really liked the. I liked the to get the physical product through the door, but you know, obviously. I remember when I first time brought the name mm -hmm. to, on the t and said, I think this is what the name we should use. Mm -hmm. We had looked at. We were. We were. Um, at the time, we were already in. We, we, we were all over Netflix. Mm -hmm. 
an early investors in Netflix. Mm. Oh, okay. um, but Netflix now is sort of the darling of everything. At the time, it was a bit of a wobbly outfit yeah. in America. And it yeah. appeared at the same time as Love Film, is that? No, no, no. before. Before? No. Yeah. <coughs> no, no, we were studying them very carefully. Okay. And it was out of frustration because we said to Netflix, could we partner with you in Europe? Yeah. And we have this uh, art house cinema chain, we could be kind of a good partner. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had lots of co interesting conversations with them, but they, um, they, weren't, they weren't really interested in that. Mm -hmm. And then said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, I'm told this to Reed Hastings, I'm gonna then s take all the money I made on, on Netflix and start a competitor. <laughs> uh, he didn't find it very funny. <laughs> um, but we maintain very good uh, contact and have been friends uh, ever since. But it's, um, I think you regretted it a bit because when they then set up to launch mm -hmm. in the UK the first time, mm -hmm. they realized that the competition was way too stiff and they pulled the plug. Mm -hmm. They even hired people and had warehouse and everything. Yeah. And then they didn't launch. Okay. And then they came back several years later. Yeah. Um, and of course they are now everywhere and been hugely successful. Um, but I, I would say that today the real film depth of catalog is only available uh, on uh, on Amazon. Okay. Because Amazon has this ability to say, well, we, we may not necessarily be able to give you a film in, in your Prime subscription, yeah. but if you're willing to pay, mm -hmm. you can find it. Yeah. And if we don't have it on, on streaming, we will be able to source it on DVD or Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. And if that's not possible, we may even try to dig out a VHS for you in the kind of some some reseller, you know, in yeah. in from somewhere. So the the chances that they will be able to meet your demand in some way yeah. is is the best there. And what do you think with Apple just launching their new on-demand service? Do you, how do you think that will change? I, I think I'm, I have been underwhelmed by Apple yeah. so many times when it comes to services. Okay. So their music service was terrible. Yeah. Uh, I don't think this is going to be much better. But they're going to put a lot of muscle behind it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, I, I hope they prove me wrong, but yeah. I'm very doubtful that yeah. they will get that right. Because I'm not so sure if they were willing to give the people who run it the autonomy that's required to yeah. do it properly. Because they can't just come um, in as the sort of the, the, the me too, it, they have lots of footprint, sure, mm -hmm. but the service needs to be excellent. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that uh, Apple's uh, services are as good as they need to be. Yeah. So I haven't seen anything from them that is proper innovation uh, on that front that's going to um, make me convinced that they're going to win. Yeah. Um, and, and do you have any part to play still when the Amazon, um, no. as part of Amazon, not completely exit? Like no, other than, other than we, uh, I have a, f a bunch of production companies that make stuff yeah. for Netflix and Amazon, yeah. and I'm sure now Apple too, I, just, I, don't, I don't follow all the projects, yeah, sure, but sure. Uh, they are definitely feeding those, those uh, and it's much simpler now. And, and why do you think App, um, sorry, Amazon have held on to that Love Film brand? Like it flashes up before mm -hmm. Amazon launches when you mm -hmm. launch it on the TV, mm -hmm. but it, they don't use it anywhere. There's, there's I don't know. I mean, I, I I even tried to buy it back, yeah. um, <laughs> but they wouldn't have that. Um, because nothing, nothing. I think nothing it's a great brand. I mean, but it just it appears once <coughs> and, and once. I think something. it's a great brand. Yeah, and they could do yeah. something really mm -hmm. exciting with it. Um, and the brand, the, the kind of the chief brand steward uh, at Amazon, for Amazon, is, um, is Simon Morris, who used to run marketing for Love Film. Okay. So he's just been climbing the, the, climbing the sort of ladder inside of Amazon, uh, and he's a, he's a genius marketeer. Yeah. And I'm, I know he loves that brand. Mm -hmm. Not just because he made it, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but because he actually knows what he's talking about. Yeah. And I think he's gonna reemerge somehow in a way which uh, will be exciting. Yeah. That's, you know. Ha that. Having been on that journey with Love Film from kind of experimental beginnings to eventually selling it to Amazon, what were the biggest things that you learned? It's a very good question. I mean, I learned many things along the way. Um, I, I think that the um, uh, f the first thing was stay true to the brand promises you make. So if you try to make a brand, you better 
you better be able to deliver against the brand promises. Mm -hmm. And we set the bar pretty high in that we wanted to be able to really delight the, the core film freaks. Mm -hmm. We needed to be able to deliver uh, a breadth uh, of offering and especially when the, in the early days with the DVD stuff, we, we had a very sophisticated neural net that made sure that all the subscribers were, were delighted as often as possible. Mm -hmm. We couldn't delight them all the time. That meant that if you had a, a, a list of films you wanted to see, mm -hmm. we, we couldn't always give you your top choice all the time, mm -hmm. but we could at least make sure that we made sure that you were f often enough um, uh, delighted. And as the flow of DVDs became bigger, we had also more, the, the algorithms became better tuned. Sure. Uh, and we also then can see that where we could say, well, customer A have, we, we, we in essence, we've over delighted her for, for the last sort of five weeks, whereas customer B We've been we, we're, we're struggling a bit. We need to we need to Super. tune that a bit. And it, and it's not it's also let's also remember here, this is a dirt cheap service yeah. compared to what they could get. So they could get as much film is they, if they really wanted to turn this stuff, they could just keep going. Yeah. And we had some people who did that. Yeah. Um, but and you also when you look at then the lifetime value of customers, mm -hmm. you always look at that on a singular basis, and that is a mistake. So you look at it and say, well, customer A have uh, pays a certain amount per month, and they see a certain amount of films, and then the, you have to sort of you do the math on that, yeah. and say, well, actually, it turns out that that person sees a lot of film. We're not making much money on that, um, but what you then don't factor in is that that person has also recruited ten subscribers mm, yeah, yeah. because the person just is is the film guy mm -hmm. in their office yeah. and uh, and so if you then start to think about this holistically we came to the, the range of lifetime value of our customers mm -hmm. was the more sort of rational I am a customer I pay this amount and I stay for two years and and no other elements and the, just the cost of serving that but then you've got the customer who goes out of their way to evangelize love film, right. who just couldn't get enough, and who came to our events and who, who, who uh, started to prophesize uh, in in the early beginnings of social media, and uh, and we found out that probably our top customer probably was uh, had a lifetime value of something like ten thousand pounds. Yeah. And we, we, we st you, you, you start to think of them almost like employees. Mm -hmm. you, wouldn't, you should never cross that, yep. uh, uh, that sort of uh, boundary. boundary. Yep. But you should think of them as being at least on the cost side of the equation. So we made sure that that person got invited to all the premieres mm. and got you know, red carpet stuff yep. and you know, T-shirts and yeah. mugs and it's worth spending on them yeah. because they're gonna. Yeah. But but it's spending on them as a customer. But they all. But, but, but we realize that there is um, that there is some there's a kind of a mutual beneficial. Uh, but it was based on passion. Yeah. And like I, early we had, influencers. Or <coughs> exactly, and yeah. that we we use that I've used that for pretty much all the businesses I've been involved with yeah. since is understanding that your customers come on a spectrum. Yeah. And you uh, and, and part of that spectrum is so much more valuable than just their custom. Yeah. Um, and, and and I think it's um, uh, it's it's goes for any business. Yeah. Or at least any business where there is some degree of passion involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the kind of businesses I'm interested in. Mm. Um, Great. Um, so you, you mentioned you've been creatively involved in a lot of things and of course um, most of your businesses are in the creative industries or entertainment. Mm. How does creativity play a big part in your life? Well, it, no, no, yeah, no, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's, a good, it's a good question and I, I, I kind of divide it into three buckets. I have my rather obscure own art projects. Mm -hmm. and they are proper obscure <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, there's no commercial element to them yeah. whatsoever mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then there's the companies that I'm involved with that have a creative element to what they do, where I engage in the, the creative processes they're involved with. Yep. Um, some probably would say I meddle, but uh, <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> uh, but where I can be enough involved that, uh, with the creatives that they res that we have a kind of mutual understanding that I, I'm kind of one of them, mm -hmm. but I also back off and th try to allow the, the teams to do what they're good at. Um, and then there's a the third bucket, <coughs> which is a really important, and they kind of interact a little bit, which is experiments. Yeah. And where I really want to know how next generation systems and tools and technologies and cameras and lights mm -hmm. and whatever works. Mm -hmm. And the only way to do that is to do it. Yeah. So I have made, you know, 3D pieces. I've made VR stuff. I've yeah. done all kinds of things because I, I, I don't want to be in a situation where I've, it's everything is sort of, I've read about it or I've, yeah. I've spoken to people like you and you tell me this is how we do things mm -hmm. and I, I sort of kind of infer mm -hmm. what I know. I would like to, that's also why I have a kind of like a yeah, whole, kind of a whole, of stuff, whole of stuff of, uh, <laughs> of gadgets that I'm yeah. playing around with yeah. at all times. Yeah, this interests me a lot, I just want to pick things up. Yeah, and exactly. <laughs> and mo I mean, some of it's rubbish, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but it was a good idea at the time. Yeah. Uh, and so I love it. Are you, are you yeah. always an early adopter with new gadgets and new toys and tech? And uh, all, 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 always. Yeah. And I, and I have, you know, lots of arrows in my back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> where where we um, uh, where we try to do fabulous things mm -hmm. that Too spectacularly early. failed. <laughs> <laughs> um, I remember at the Media Lab. This sounds now like a like a sort of uh, uh, really strange situation. Uh, there was a very smart man called Thad um, Starner who was uh, who came up with the first uh, wearable VR experience. Mm -hmm. And we also, okay, we're done. We're, this is going to be it. It's VR. This was in 1995. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were sold on this thing. Okay, it weighed, you know, 40 kilos. Uh, and, you know, your neck almost <laughs> twisted. And it was just a bunch of green lines that, was, that had a kind of was node-based yeah. sense of space. Yeah. So when you moved your head, you could see that it, it sort of worked. Yeah. But it was lots of latency and lots of issues, sure. and you know the the the, the battery the battery pack uh, burnt in like two minutes, and it was Much like, like our lights, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, but it was it was a great vision for what's to come. Yeah. And I I am now on my fourth VR kind of yes, we're there, mm -hmm. uh, but we're not. Yeah. And I must say I was so disappointed when I put on Magic Leap. Leaf, uh, magic leap Have you tried glasses. It? Yeah, I'm dying and to try like, the magic leap. It's like, oh. it's interesting, yeah. but it's th it's not there. Yeah, uh, and I'm a, you know I love the the Oculus Vision. Mm -hmm. It's just not working. Mm -hmm. It's not good enough. Mm -hmm. And I don't think the creative tools are 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 as strong as they. And, and I've now been engaged with some of the very best people in this, and we try to come up with some very exciting opportunities yeah. to tell stories and so on. It's just not happening, mm -hmm. and I'm uh, I'm uh, maybe the fifth time it will <laughs> happen. Have you been to the Void? Yes. VR? Yeah, you've yeah, been, yeah. yeah. And I visited the Void headquarters. I met the okay. people who run it, mm -hmm. and we talked about kind of their roadmap, and you know, we mm -hmm. even looked at investing in them, mm -hmm. and you know, great, great. Yeah. I love what they're doing, mm -hmm. but it is very narrow. So yeah. what they can do is site-specific stuff that yeah. will delight people. But it's not going to be like you. You will don't have it in your home no, yeah. per se. And the um, uh, the Oculus Go, Go was an um, interesting kind of step to get. Could we bring the cost down? Could we make it you know less dependent on sure. on uh, uh, the constraints that had been criticised, uh, mm -hmm. particularly get rid of cables and all that stuff. And yes, but it's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that means that you don't, you know, I, I, my, it's also, in, I have teenage kids now, so I, I sort of road test, well they, you know, they test all this stuff. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, not one of them spent more than half an hour on the uh, Oculus Go. Yeah. 
and they said, no, it's not. Do you, th do you think it's that barrier of that it's so isolating on your own and that when augmented reality mm. finally catches up, so maybe like the next version of the Magic Leap or you know, five versions down, that you know, so suddenly you can be together in a room and you mm. can be interacting with something, do you think? Maybe, uh, I mean, that could be. Uh, and I, it could also be that are we s trying to solve for something that people don't really need? <laughs> yeah. Um, and are we, is it a dimension to it that we that we're missing. Mm -hmm. so, uh, in th so in 3D filmmaking, mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, so we worked, we worked very long with Samsung. Samsung was d developing a glassless 3D concept, mm -hmm. big R&D project, and we were together we were working on developing a very interesting project around the history of art, okay. called the impossible history of art. Um, and that was to, to use 3D in a way that you could create uh, spaces uh, that, had, that had never existed and collection of arts that had never been put together. Yeah. So unbuilt buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright. Yeah. Uh, and in there we would put together a collection of art that had never seen each other ever. Mm -hmm. and, and so on. So this is, a, this is a way of thinking about space and, and experiences in ways that was impossible. Mm -hmm. A very exciting project, um, and uh, eventually they pulled the plug on it because they uh, couldn't make the screens work. Yeah, and then we were like, okay, that that was it, and so th th we there was a lot of lot of uh, effort and, and time and uh, and passion that was put into that mm -hmm. um, that we didn't say, okay, we'll have to wait. Um, but I'm, we found very few moments that were because we did a lot of filming. Mm -hmm. It was only the, what really kind of got us kind of goosebumps was when we saw sculpture in, in dimensions. Yep. Very, very slow moving images mm -hmm. in 3D uh, that allowed you to see sculptures in a way that you otherwise couldn't. Yep. Uh, and similarly, um, uh, my, uh, my friend uh, Vin Benders, when he made Pina, uh, most of it is 2D filmmaking mm -hmm. that has been stretched, or has that where 3D sort of works. Yeah. But there are a couple of moments in there that are pure magic, yeah. where you see, because dance is extremely difficult to film, where you see suddenly that the 3D uh, treatment gave a dimension to it that you, you would never be able to capture in 2D. And it was amazing. And that thing, that's also, I think, why he... I mean, it's a it was a good story well told. So, that, so that's also why he was Oscar nominated and you know, it was a huge success worldwide. Sure. But it was also those moments that were just extraordinary. Um, and, and I always look for those. And because if you if you can create a few of them, mm -hmm. you can probably create many. But unfortunately, the three D kind of bubble came and went, mm -hmm. and we are now in the VR bubble, come and go. Mm -hmm. And I and I haven't really see, no one has yet showed me any augmented reality mm -hmm. that f feels like oh I have to stop everything now and focus. I have to really get to know that. I have yet to be awed, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I'm I'm I want to be awed. <laughs> Have you, been, have you heard of Marshmallow Laser Feast? They've got an exhibition on at the Serpentine Gallery. No, I haven't seen it. I would recommend it. Yep. It's the best VR thing I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, it's quite an abstract like point cloud. It's okay. all about our relationship with nature and trees and oxygen. Yep. So you kind of interact with it um, through your heartbeat and mm. your breath. So it's got a breath mm. sensor that will show you. I love it. Um, but you can also see all the other people. There's like maybe eight people in this small exhibit with you. Mm -hmm. And they're kind of an abstract shape. So you can see them pulsing as a point cloud and it's amazing. It's I love kind it. Of like a meditative type thing. Hmm. And it was the first time that you like definitely got lost in that world and hmm. um, saw the kind of how it could be, you know, there's a real use for it. It's like a meditative calming yeah. thing that improved your awareness. It's, no, I'm I'm you know, I, I, you know I'm, a, I'm a fan of VR. I'm but I'm a, I'm a little bit of a disgruntled fan yeah. of VR. <laughs> yeah. um, I would love for it to be successful. Mm -hmm. It's just been so far quite disappointing. I have zero tolerance for 
stuff that isn't really good. Um, I, I, I also like sort of, you know, scruffy treatments of people shooting with um, Super 8 and that sort of thing. Yeah. But it has, a, it's a, it has an aesthetic quality yeah. that when chosen, that becomes a perfect thing. But the, what I'm, the imperfections I'm talking yeah, about is more yeah, about just not mistakes. Quite there yet. Yeah, yeah. It's like it, it's moving quite enough, fast yeah. enough, and it's sort of you know got glitches, and you know it's and, and it's heavy, and it's like you know th yeah. those kinds of things. That's not that's not a artistic choice. It's just inconvenient and yeah. bad. Yeah. So uh, Thomas, like it's been really inspiring to hear all your stories, and you've got so much going on. How do you divide uh, your attention and keep focused? Um, with so much on the go, like, mm. I suppose for you know anyone listening or watching, you know how do, how do you manage all of that <laughs> and stay sane? Well, it's a uh, it's a mixture of techniques. First of first and foremost, my principal job is to identify talent yeah. and let them do whatever they're good at, yeah. and try to get out of the way. But at the same time, being enough involved that that the, the reason why the talent wanted to work with me in the first place is intact. In other words, that I can dip in and out and try to, try to challenge them to, for them to be the best they can be. Mm -hmm. uh, rather than kind of feeding them with stuff that, that is sort of fulfilling my aspirations. That's not, necessary, that's not a good uh, mix. Sometimes, it is, sometimes there is a, a flow that ends up starting with an embryo of an idea yeah. that then goes a few rounds inside of that company and then comes back as, as their own ideas, and they're generally their ideas, mm -hmm. um, and that's fine. And, 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 and I think we have um, and lots of examples of that, which uh, I'm, I'm both proud of, but also very happy to see that that is possible because then you really have an exchange and, and you come up with something better. Because they usually take what, what is an embryo of an idea and actually make it into something that's possible. Sure. That is, that m turns into a product or a service or a film or something. And so, but to, for me to deliver on that mm -hmm. is that I try to be 100% in the moment. Mm -hmm. That means that, so if I am at Park Circus, I'm only at Park Circus, yeah. and I'm I focus 100% on what they're up to, sure. and I keep that hat on yeah. firmly. Even if that means that they have something going that might be competitive with one of my other companies, mm -hmm. or that there is something else going on, I always try to make be very firm in where where I am, sure. and I can switch from one to another uh, in a, in a heartbeat, yeah. uh, and and be in that other situation, and I think that. That ability to to be 100% yeah. in one thing and 100% in another thing mm -hmm. um, is probably the only kind of trait I have, which is which is uh, valuable. Yeah. So uh, does that kind of stop you procrastinating on everything? It's just like you just zone into that one thing. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and uh, and also I, I I probably take on too many things. Mm -hmm. um, but I have been that I've been kind of gradually become a bit better at at saying no, and and also delegating to others uh, or to um, avoid taking on a certain type of of activity that I will fail to deliver at. Um, but it is uh, it's always it's always difficult and, and there's there's endless opportunities. Yeah. Uh, and so, so what does an average day look like in the life of Thomas? Just run us through one sort of average day. Right? So an average day would probably be that um, uh, I, I try to start every day with a bit of exercise because mm -hmm. that's the kind of I, I keep uh, keep sane and I spend some time with my, my family in the morning. Um, and then usually what I start is I, I start with some phone calls in the morning where I talk to some of my, uh, my uh, various um, companies and, and projects that I'm working on. Uh, and that could be uh, anything from a short call to a conference call with other people. Uh, I then have a whole bunch of meetings yeah. and many meetings. And the meetings are usually where there is, there is some kind of focal point where a decision has to be made. Um, or preparation for su such. 
um, and that and that could be that could be um, I could go through five, six, seven different things in a day like that. Um, I also try to spend a bit of time every week with young talent, mm -hmm. people I have no commercial relationship with, just wanting to to be helpful and build up young talent, sure. um, and dedicate quite a lot of my time to uh, work on a charitable basis um, on the, with, with the same um, and especially in on the kind of the creative side to give people who are who've got passion and, uh, and talent to the ability to get somewhere um, and yeah okay and then lastly um, so you know being on the journey that you've been on and you know it's, it's really inspiring for us to hear and I'm sure for all our listeners if you could Give yourself a piece of advice to young Thomas, and we're back mm -hmm. at the beginning of your journey. What's the one thing that now you would like to have told yourself, or would like to tell kind of any of our viewers who are just starting out on their creative journey or business journey? You know. Yeah. Well, I think the the most important thing is to just do stuff, yeah. and to produce things, and not just think about it. So whether that's making music or films or plays or poetry or art, whatever, is just make stuff and make it for yourself or make it your mates or your family and, and, and make it again and try and, and build up the, the, the ability to execute because you know, there's millions of filmmakers out there who never made a film. Yeah. Uh, and there are many artists who have got the, who've got, uh, you know, lots of primed canvases. <laughs> uh, it is about doing, and it is about getting comfortable about uh, making stuff and, and failing and, and trying again and learning how to use tools and techniques and te technology and software and, you know, and, and, and getting to, um, there's a craft element of what we all do. Uh, and that craft is, is really important to have, uh, have under your skin. And, when people are so then looking to give people opportunities, um, the first thing I ask young people is like, you know, what have you done? I don't care where you're in a school or all that stuff. I want to know what you've done. Uh, and that means take, take, take jobs, even if they're shit jobs, yeah. just take them. Learn how to work for other people, learn how to earn a salary, learn how to, to do a job well uh, and uh, as early as possible make your own money, be independent, um, and uh, be able to then f mix that with, with your creativity in some way or another. Um, today, there's too much focus on academia, too much focus on getting the top grades and so on. Yeah. Way too little um, Actual experience. Yeah, yeah. You know, doing. Yeah. No. Well, thank you so much. Mm. Um, I think um, it's been great to hear all these stories and thank you for taking the time out because we know how busy you are. Um, thanks for having listening. If you've been listening on Spotify or Google Podcasts, you can also watch the full version on um, YouTube. Um, we'll be running our next version on the last Monday of every month and make sure to subscribe and join in next time.